um, a, a day in the life of uh, rail engineering or, or, or being a rail engineer. Um, so I'm going to give a quick intro um, to the RTSA and then uh, to, to those that are, are talking, but I'm not going to go into um, them too much because they're all going to, to introduce themselves. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm Daniel Hedefin. I um, am a civil engineer, um, been working in, in rail uh, since 1999, where I, I started in Palmerston North, and I currently work for Kira Rail. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been the, uh, the chair of the Rail Technical Society of Australasia, um, also known as the RTSA. Um, I'll talk more about that in just, just a moment, but um, our talkers today, speakers today, are uh, uh, Danny Cox, uh, Jared Seeley, Ria, Andy and Barbara and they're all going to, to introduce themselves in a bit more detail um, but first off I'd, I'd like to just take you through what um, the Rail Technical Society of Australasia or RTSA does. Um, yeah so as, as the name hints we're not just a New Zealand uh, technical group we're across Australasia so Australia and New Zealand. Um, we're a technical branch of Engineers Australia and Engineering New Zealand. So we have several branches um, in the, a branch in each state of Australia as well. Um, our, our objectives, um, we, we're trying to, to contribute to improving of technical knowledge um, on railway engineering, um, both in New Zealand and Australia. So we, we try and share information across the Tasman. And we wanna support the, the rail industry um, and it is an industry. Um, worldwide uh, so we have some some good links to to other places outside of Australia and really important thing for, for professional engineers is, is your professional development so we run um, a couple of events a month um, where we do talks uh, or um, uh, meetings where we we have rail engineers and others come in and present on on technical matters and, and things of interest to other engineers um, and we help with conferences, um, not just in New Zealand, but in Australia as well. Uh, if, you know, our website is listed there and also obviously the, uh, the cost of joining and there's a decent discount for, for graduates. Um, so another, another nice thing that we do is um, we have awards. Um, so every two years we have a conference generally in Australia um, and we, we offer awards for professionals, um, rail scholarships. Um, so that can be for people that are still studying, um, young railway engineers. And I think the definition of being young has been less than younger than 34, um, or graduate engineers. Uh, and those are presented. And um, if you're lucky enough to receive one, hopefully you get a trip to Australia to, to, to do that. Um, so that, that's, that's me and, and talking about the RTSA. I'll, I'll be back to take questions at the end. Um, so I think it got mentioned putting questions in the Q&A, uh, but now handing over to our, our first speaker, uh, Danny. I just might be on mute there, mate. Apologies there. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, it's good. all good. Thank you. Right, a day in the life of what I do as a, as a rail engineer. Um, next week presenting today. Got some technical difficulties here, John. And... There we go. So uh, a bit about me, I'm, uh, I'm the principal um, rail engineer for down in New Zealand. Um, so I sort of sit across all the, the engineering rail cohort for, for Downer. Um, 21 years in, in the rail industry, uh, sort of boy to man. Uh, left school at 16, um, had enough of school. Um, quickly realized after five years on a shovel that I, I sort of needed to uh, back myself up with some, some learning. So I ended up um, going back and studying my uh, my B engine and MSc to sort of facilitate probably where I've got to today, which, which was uh, uh, good in hindsight. 
Um, uh, married three, three children, been in, uh, been in New Zealand for four years. Um, hobbies include football, fishing, and sort of days out with the family. Um, what I was going to speak about today is one of the projects that uh, I'm currently involved in um, as engineering manager, uh, which is Wiritiki Park. So Wiritiki Park is, uh, is one of the sort of biggest projects other than CRL that are being delivered at the minute uh, in New Zealand Rail. And it's to facilitate um, building a new third third main track um, from Wirri Junction to Key Park in, in specific areas uh, across the network to, uh, to um, get the freight trains off the two lines uh, and, and improve the, uh, the transport network uh, once CRL is open. So uh, as you can imagine, there's, there's quite a lot of, lot of work involved in that. We're, we're sort of halfway through it and, uh, and looking to um, sort of commission that by the end of 2023. In line with CRO being open. Um, so what do I do? Um, so I manage the design and engineering management um, over uh, specific uh, rail disciplines. So when I'm talking about rail disciplines, we, we normally split them up into sort of four or five different categories on major projects. So you have your civil and structural elements, which could be anything from overhead line bases to formations to bridges and assets. Uh, structural elements. Um, we also have overhead line electrification and traction power, which are the, the cables that hang off of structures and power the EMU chain. So you've got your the, the continuous wires that power power the EMUs that keep them going up and down. Uh, we've got signals and telecommunication elements, which are which is basically signaling and interlocking. Um, also do traction traction control and uh, and and how the the interlocking systems work. And then we've got um, the, the, the rail tracks, the actual tracks and sleepers that the trains run on uh, and, and keep stable on. So what's what's pretty unique about uh, multidisciplinary projects is uh, I'll just sort of highlight here with snippets of design drawings and stuff that each designer is normally different. They're normally specialised to each element uh, and trying to integrate, sorry, trying to integrate all these these systems is, is, is uh, a task, task in itself. So Moves me on to my next um, next slide. So, how do we integrate the, these systems through design? So, one of the main things we need to do is is interdisciplinary checks, what are known as IDCs, and that's that's where we we get all the designers, all the system, different discipline designs, all, all talking to each other and overlaying designs to ensure there's no clashes, to make sure that the system uh, is going to be functioning, uh, and to make sure that what we're going to build is actually going to be fit for operation. So I just got a bit of a, a, a real life sort of um, example here from, from the last few weeks where we, we did an IDC on the, the overhead line wires uh, versus the signaling design. And what you can probably see is a couple of clouded areas there where we've not actually reached the, the standard clearances. So this, this, this whole, um, this whole investigation IDC work led to some additional design changes to make sure that the, the design was fully functional and we could build it correctly. Um, so leading on to, to something I'll just touch on um, briefly because I know uh, Mr. Lyon might uh, enhance this a little bit, but how do we how do we work a bit smarter? How do we sort of um, get rid of these clashes as we're actually designing it? So one thing that we've we've uh, installed uh, with Kiwi Rail collaboratively on where to keep park is working off a, uh, a 3D platform for design, which has reaped all sorts of benefits. So I've just cut a few snippets here. Um, it's actually building up, building up the design model in real life, uh, make, making sure that, you, I mean, it's, it's stopping you from actually walking down the track. You can iron out all the issues, create workflows for designers where these clashes as you're actually working through the design progression. Um, I've just put a, a bit of a, a photo there where it's, we, we use the sight vision sort of uh, handheld device uh, where we, we transferred the 3D model into the sight vision. And we, we uh, on handback of one of the blocker lines, we actually confirmed that we got the gauge clearance from the signals, which sort of saved, I don't know, it could save four to six hours work from a survey team actually taking points and stuff. Um, so, it's, I mean, introducing um, digital engineering into rail is, 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 is the way forward and it's how, how we're going to work more efficiently and smarter. Uh, I've just put a, a bit of a wheel on here to, to just show that obviously when we, when we talk about digital engineering in rail, it's not just um, dedicated to, to 3D design models. It's actually all the coordination, the, the, the paperless sort of 
um, documents that we produce to, to sort of make it more efficient. The monthly has built in and sort of machine avoidance models that, uh, that all feed into the health and safety processes on site. Um, what else do I get involved in? So I've put a few um, live examples here of, of some of the temporary works management uh, that people seem to sometimes overlook. So what's critical to delivering a project is the staging and, and, and temporary works and how you're going to how you're going to actually get to the end state. So on the left here, we, we as part of package two on Rich Key Park, we installed a, um, a long um, retaining wall and a piling platform to actually facilitate installing the uh, permanent piles. Uh, what's quite unique about working in rail is it's not no, it's not just limited to civil and structural elements. You've, there is an interdisciplinary part of it. So as you can see in this, in this photo, you've got um, overhead line equipment quite close to metallic objects. So we had to do um, dewiment checks and ended up earthing and bonding um, some of that structure or most of the structure just to make sure uh, we were we were compliant with safety regulations. Um, a couple of others here, we've um, designed whole roads to install a new formation for the third track. Uh, the one at the bottom was uh, pretty unique. We, we demolished a existing footbridge at Westfield Junction um, we had to sort of assess every span as we lifted that off structurally just to make sure that it wasn't going to topple over onto the tracks of anybody below uh, as we lifted it. And through collaboration with Kiwi Rail and the yards, we actually dropped, uh, lifted and dropped the bridge decks onto, um, onto trains and, and pulled them away to South Down, a way to be removed. So pretty, pretty unique. Um, so... What's, uh, what's key to a successful rail project in, 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 in our eyes? So communication, communication between designers, between uh, all stakeholders, between the construction team is key from the outset. Everybody's got to have skin in the game and uh, sort of be pulling in the same direction. Um, teamwork and collaboration is pretty, pretty key. Um, if, you've got, um, if you've got people not willing to collaborate um, and, and putting blockers up, particularly in, with integrating designs, you're, you, you, you're a non-starter, really. Um, system integration, that's what I mean by that, is, is the disciplines all working and functioning together. Um, making sure there's design safe. So I'm talking about the design being safe. I'm not just talking about the, the, the asset or structure standing up. I'm talking about how do we ensure that what we're proposing to build or designing is safe to actually be constructed. Are we consulting the construction team? Are we ironing out all the risks and putting control measures in place? And then also thinking about the end of life. So when the structure's reached its uh, intended design life, are we what are we doing to uh, to ensure that when it's demolished or demoed, that, it, that it's actually going to be safe to be taken down and what process we're putting in place? Um, making sure that whatever we're building has got a functional outcome and it's in the it's got to be improving the current system um, that we're working with. It's pointless, pointless putting putting uh, assets at risk and, and and making them worse than when you started. So um, I just put a bit of a snippet down at the bottom that we, I mean, working is with Downer. One of our key sort of pillars is relationships creating success, and this sort of feeds into the communication and teamwork and collaboration element, which is the number one and number two in there. Um, so why rail engineering? Um, for me, it's, it's, it's a rewarding career. It's um, after all the, the arguing and integrating and planning and replanning to actually get on site and see something being built that you've had active involvement in for sort of six months or so. It's, it's very rewarding. Um, you're creating a legacy outcome. Um, works in sort of Auckland and Wellington and all, all over New Zealand. You, 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 you're upgrading uh, the infrastructure for the next generation. People, people are going to be able to get to work quicker and faster. You, you're taking cars off the road. You, you, you're improving everything. Um, upskilling the next generation. So, if you come into sort of rail engineering, it's a continuous improvement of, of sort of methods and ways of working. And you're also passing passing the knowledge on to the next generation to make it even better. Uh, rail's a key industry for New Zealand and worldwide. Uh, and I don't think there's any let up there. I think it's going to keep sort of developing and getting better. Um, there's a heavy pipeline of forward works in New Zealand in particular. Um, next 20, 30 year that people are talking about, there's all sorts of things in the pipeline. And uh, rail engineering is actually a recognized specialism 
and, and it's a career pathway to chartership now. So there's, there's all sorts of things going on with engineers in New Zealand and the ICE and those types of um, institutions um, to sort of create them pathways. And I think um, most of all, it's, it's pretty fun uh, being a rail engineer. Um, being a bit of a rail nerd myself, uh, it, it's great to see how the industry is sort of developing. So, yeah, that's about me. I appreciate your time. Thank you. We'll pass on to Jared. Good afternoon. So I'll do a bit of a introduction into myself. Um, I'm Jared Sisley, and I'm the regional delivery leader for QRL. Um, that's probably a bit of a, sorry. Okay. Yep, sorry, just checking that. Um, so what, before I go into sort of how my career started, a little bit about myself. So I'm a mechanical engineer um, with a bachelor's mechanical engineering from Central Queensland University in Australia. Um, obviously I am Australian, not New Zealand. There. So um, as I guess from the start here, the career has offered me an opportunity to move internationally, um, as you can outline here. So I started my career as a uh, intern doing reliability engineering work with a company called Horizon or Queensland Rail, as it was at the time. Um, and through that, I was offered an opportunity to take a graduate engineering position, um, which I did then pursued a number of different roles as that graduate engineering role, working through design, project management, um, then moving into Pacific National, which is another large rail company in Australia, a lot like Kiwi Rail, where I moved into back into reliability engineering, um, looking at the maintenance and reliability of trains, um, then into asset management. So looking after the assets, uh, their whole of life costs, uh, making sure their maintenance is all correct, project managing. Um, then finished up there, moved across to New Zealand with QRL and took a position as performance engineering manager. Again, rolling stock reliability engineering, looking at maintenance and reliability, project management, and then moved into my current role, which is the delivery leader, which is maintenance management. So lots of words there. Uh, what does it really all mean? So unlike everyone else today, I actually play with the trains that run on the tracks um, while everyone else builds the tracks and the overheads and, and the likes. Um, we get to play with the really fun stuff. Uh, the trains and the tracks and the overheads are all fun to build. But they don't do much once you've uh, finished building them. The trains are a bit of a toy to play with for life. And I mean, what little boy or little girl hasn't played with the train set when they were a lot younger. So what does sort of my current role encompass um, I would say the closest equivalent to try and understand it is um, I'm, I guess you'd say the chief hospital uh, manager for the hospitals that look after the trains. So in effect, I'm the chief, chief, chief train doctor is a better way to put it. Um, and we look after fixing the trains. It's the easiest way to put it. So trains come in, they did their regular checkups come for their maintenance um, and we look at opportunities to try and make sure that those trains can run as long as possible um, and do the job that they need to do, moving people, moving passengers, moving freight, moving uh, pits of material around the countryside um, and don't break down, you know, it'll get sick. So we look at lots of different types. Um, so I've, these are examples of different ones that I've worked in closely over the years. So we've got electric locomotives. So they run on the tracks using overhead electrification. So the overhead lines that Danny spoke of, um, they take the, basically the electricity from the network, from the power stations, straight through an electrical wire um, and convert that power into being able to move the locomotives. We then have uh, shunt locomotives. So shunting is the task of moving rail vehicles. So that what that means is things like the wagons, um, passenger carriages, they can't move themselves through the day um, because they don't have engines, they don't have motors. So we use what we call shunt locomotives to move them around into different tracks when we need to build the trains up, whether we're putting lots of wagons together, whether we're putting a passenger carriage set together to make sure that that cafe car is in the right order to the other passenger cars. Um, so we go through and that's called a task called shunting and they've dedicated small little trains that are locomotives called shunt locomotives that do that work. And we've got 
diesel locomotives. So they're a lot like the electrics. They're big main mainline locomotives. They haul long trains. Um, in New Zealand, those long trains are about four or 500 meters long, holding up to about 40 wagons. Um, and they can operate anywhere internationally up to sort of two and a half kilometers long, holding 260 wagons, depending on how many locomotives there may be. Now these locomotives, they go through a process so they can be paired up or, or added in group um, and coupled together to allow them to run and provide more power. It's a lot like a bit, putting a couple of cars in, in a row to haul more trailers. Uh, and then the wagons. The wagons are effectively trailers that couple together. So lots of them can be attached together and they haul the goods around. So they can change from everything from the ones at the top, which hold bulk materials such as grains, coal, um, ore minerals, uh, ballast, which is the material that goes underneath the train tracks, um, to the ones at the bottom, which are like um, container or intermodal vehicles. And they would move box containers around um, things that would carry your general goods and services, um, anything from TVs, um, TVs, retail goods, shipping, all that sort of stuff would get placed on those to get moved around. So this is the breadth of um, what being a rolling stock engineer or a rolling stock worker in the rail industry, um, the different types of vehicles that you could be involved with. So it's not just all working in, in the sheds. Um, I've been involved with quite a number of different projects and they've ranged from things like uh, incident recovery. So unfortunately there are times when trains don't stay on the tracks uh, and we actually need to get them back onto the tracks so they can continue to do their work and be safe. So examples there of the derailment we've undertook where we had to um, deal with overhead wires, uh, had to deal with lots of different unstable materials that Trains obviously quite heavy. They can be up to 100 to 130 tons. Um, so that's sitting on an angle, resting against different material that's not designed to actually hold those loads and those weights. So to be very careful how we remove that and also be careful with the people that we're using to move that, making sure no one's in the way. Uh, nobody gets crushed, nobody gets hurt, nobody gets injured. So lots of concern around things like that. Then we've got um, part of the actual design um, and manufacture. So a lot like Danny was explaining, the different design processes are going through and building a, a, um, a train track and the various different infrastructure pieces. Uh, similar pieces are done around building locomotives and wagons. Um, so this is a photo of a locomotive getting manufactured in uh, a manufacturing facility in China. Uh, and during my career, I was lucky enough to spend three weeks over in China, um, working through the process and seeing the different locomotive parts getting manufactured together. So that was a really good example, um, but that work also occurs in New Zealand, occurs in Australia, so, uh, and over in America. So there's lots of different places that that type of work happens. Um, even with Kinkiwa Rail, we do refurbishments and strip downs very similar to this on our, on our own fleet. And that's um, type of work that if you were to get involved with uh, Kiwa Rail or the rail industry, you might have exposure to. Uh, and the last piece where there is an example of a, of a small maintenance depot that I had the honor of um, being in charge of very early in my career when I was working there. And I worked with a good little team of about uh, 10 people. And we used to maintain those electric locomotives um, in a small little shed. And we could do probably one or two a week. And we'd work together as a team and we'd make sure that they were getting their services, changing their oils, a lot like you would for your car, sink and taking it into the dealership to get that, uh, that service check, change the oils, check the fluids, turn the tires type of thing. So about my current role. So I don't have a lot of slides um, to go through and I'm mindful there's other presenters to go through. So what does my current role, I guess, as delivery leader involved? Well, it's pretty all encompassing as I sort of outlined before. It's that diagnostic and repair of wagons and locomotives. So when they do fail and here's some photos of things that have failed, it's not just, um, it's not all blowing steam, but and it's not all blowing smoke, but a lot of the time, there's a lot of interesting things that can occur um, in failures that if you've got a little bit of technical mind to you, whether you want to be a mechanic or whether you want to uh, be an engineer, there's lots of interesting things that can be worked on and exposed to on a daily basis um, in terms of working in this environment. So there's also assisting with uh, locomotive and wagon incidents, like I mentioned before, collisions, derailments. Um, I said collisions, unfortunately, there are times when 
locomotives or wagons might be involved in a collision. That could be anything from a slip where some rocks or a tree might fall across the track with undue weather. Um, or it could be, unfortunately, some animals um, that make their way under the tracks. So there's lots of different things that get involved with um, and we're involved in the recovery of those vehicles, making sure that they can be safe to return and do their duties. Then there's also the coordinating task. So looking after the daily activities of the, of the team working. So assigning duties, making sure everyone's trained, making sure they're working safe, making sure they've got the tools and the equipment to do what they need to. Uh, and lastly, it's around about developing leadership structures and culture. So part of my role is being a leader. And that's really setting us up so that the roles and the teams are working in the best efficient way that they can, but they're working safely and they have a good culture together. So they're enjoying each other's company, operating safely, having fun. Um, Cause as Danny said, one of the big things for this job is that it is fun. Uh, it's not just um, coming to work, uh, getting a little bit dirty in your overalls. It's also having fun with your colleagues, uh, learning skills for life. So that's all from me, um, nice and short. Um, I'm gonna pass over to Ria. Um, and we'll thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Jared. Um, I think I've got control now. Yep. Um, so, hi, I'm Maria. I'm currently a traction and electrical engineer at Kirao. Um, considering that it's quite common for people at Kirao to clock 10 or 20 or even 50 years in some cases. Um, my three years here mean that I'm still very fresh in the rail industry. Um, so I'll be speaking more from the graduate engineer perspective. Um, so I guess, how did I get here? Um, when I was younger and in school, I really liked um, numbers and maths. So I really liked putting things together and solving puzzles and figuring out how things work. So that naturally led me to um, taking on the engineering pathway. Um, funnily enough, I didn't really get or like physics in high school, so that seemed pretty key to engineering, but I just went along with it anyway, because um, I wanted to problem solve, so I joined a bachelor's degree of engineering at AUT, and luckily physics started making sense, so that was good. Um, through first year, I realized I really enjoyed the mechanical papers better, um, did the design, and you know, it just felt more logical, so I went with that, and um, I didn't really like electrical back then, um, but yeah, so I completed a mechanical engineering degree. And um, while I was in my final year, I was trying to figure out where I wanted um, to go afterwards or what I wanted to do. Um, mechanical seemed to present a lot of options and I didn't really have a clue at that point what sort of industry I wanted to go into. Um, I was basically keeping it pretty open and then um, looking into different fields and graduate programs and at a uni careers fair, I came across Kiwira. Um, I'd never really considered rail before this. The most thought I would probably put into it was, um, you know, when I'm waiting at the train station, my train's late on my way to uni. Um, so after hearing more about the grad program, I was quite interested in it and I went through the process and that's how I started at Kiwira with the grad program. Um, so the grad program was loads of fun. I absolutely loved it. Um, and I got to rotate through about nine teams across two years. Um, and the nine teams weren't all specifically um, engineering related. It was a mix of network access, um, freight planning, protection, which is more on the operational safety side, um, different engineering disciplines, um, rolling stock. Um, yeah, so I was definitely fortunate to get a very broad exposure um, to the business. Um, and because the rotations range from about two to five months, I was constantly um, changing and adapting to different teams, communication styles, locations, and of course the actual work itself um, varied a lot as well. Um, so all this diversity and work just meant that I was gaining a lot of value in terms of learning. Um, not so much in depth, but it was actually a base level of technical knowledge um, specific to each team. Um, and I was also just building up my soft skills and um, building a network of connections um, and just learning to look at things from a different perspective, not just technical, but also commercial or client focused. Um, and then COVID sort of hit halfway through, but we just adapted again. Um, and then towards the end of the program, I was sure I wanted to stay in rail. So I, um, yeah, but I was struggling a little bit to decide on where exactly within Hero. Um, in the end, um, literally in the last couple of the rotations, I realized I really like the traction electrical space. Um, 
and it definitely changed my mind about how I disliked electrical at uni. Um, and yeah, so there was a good mix of mechanical electrical work um, tied in with a lot of the other disciplines. Um, and I could use what I'd learned. And it was mostly office based, but also lots of site visits. Um, so seeing and understanding things in person and not just behind a screen was something that was important to me. Um, and yeah, so there was plenty of learn and like lots of different projects. So I wasn't gonna get bored. Um, and so that's how I ended up in the traction and electrical engineering team. Um, so I guess what's traction and electrical cover? Um, so electric locos need power to run. So power is distributed to QRL um, traction substations or feeder stations. And then that powers that feeds into the overhead lines and then that powers loco. Um, so traction electrical engineering is, um, is associated with everything from our substations and feeder stations, the overhead lines, the structures and equipment associated with it. Um, and I guess that's the high voltage side. And then there's also low voltage supplies, um, lighting, there's earthing and bonding. So there's, there's quite a bit there. Um, and I guess that's just the assets that everyone sees on the front end, um, but the team covers providing designs and technical advice, um, as well as reviews of designs. Um, we closely support the regional maintenance teams and with asset management. Um, this also includes um, inspections and audits, and that just ties in with assurance and making sure we meet compliance requirements. Um, and as of course, with any engineering field, um, but especially in rail, um, safety is very important. So there is a component of risk management. Um, we have internal standards and documentation that guide our work. So we manage these as well, um, as well as lots of technical drawings. And so there's a bit of CAD work as well. Um, generally, also any other support work as required. Um, so that's just briefly what I've been exposed to and doing over the last year, my projects within the traction and electrical space. Um, I am still learning, but there's always plenty of support within the teams. Um, and so far it's been an exciting three years. Um, within RAL and I highly recommend it. Um, that's about it from me. So thanks, um, over to you, Andy. Thanks, Rhea. Cool. Okay. Um, hi everyone, my name is uh, Andy Lyon. I'm the Program Director for Digital Engineering at QRL. Um, so my background is uh, civil engineering. Um, I did my degree in the UK and in New Zealand for about 11, 12 years now, something like that. So I'm a chartered civil engineer. Um, and I'd say probably for most of my time, I've been working in the rail industry. I'm sort of done the big consultancy thing and then the small consultancy thing before joining QRL three and a half years ago. Um, yeah, and uh, I think like, like probably many people, I didn't necessarily intend to set out for rail as the area I wanted to work in. And I kind of fell into it. Um, after my first few projects uh, when I worked um, at Oricon. And um, I guess it's the, what is it about rail that's that's worth looking at? Um, done done my fair share of sort of civil designs and things uh, on your kind of greenfield um, subdivisions and uh, council uh, water pipes and things like that. Um, but the rail projects were also the ones that were a little bit more rewarding. And, and I think it's a bit of a theme that's come through some of the others because it, it really comes back to the complexity. So, um, you know, it's technically challenging, say, building a wastewater treatment plant as an engineer, but it's even harder to build one right in the middle of a live railway um, in a national park. And those are the kinds of projects um, I've been lucky to get involved with during my time working uh, with and for Key Rail. Um, it's also there's a lot of national roles uh, across um, you know across New Zealand with Hero, and then that's something else that's really great. You can be kind of uh, down in down in the south doing something uh, down to Eden Way and up in the mountain the next week. So um, lots of things to keep you entertained, which is which is pretty good. Um, but yeah, I think for me the the complexity piece is, is probably the, the biggest um, the biggest part about uh, wanting to continue working in the rail sector. Um, some of those problems are you know, solved with uh, traditional engineering kind of solutions applied in a different way. Um, some of them are maybe more technology based. And uh, I think with any of those complex problems, it's thinking outside the box that tends to be the, 
the, the piece you need to, to look for. And, and that's certainly something that's um, kind of at the heart of what the digital engineering team do. So uh, I've been with Kiro for about three and a half years and I really took a quite a, quite a sideways move from traditional civil um, construction and design work into the digital engineering space. Um, and it's something else, I guess, with, uh, as Ray mentioned, there's a lot of different um, avenues and areas your career can take uh, at QRL. And certainly I found that to be the case for myself as well. You can take a sudden jump across to something completely different and apply that knowledge you have. Um, so in terms of the life, day in the life of a digital engineer at QRL, um, it's a smallish team, there's about 10 of us. We predominantly help the um, capital projects. So we've got a number of large projects around the country, a couple of um, new ferry terminals. We've got the triple tracking up um, that Danny was talking about before electrification up in Auckland as well and a number of new depots and facilities around the country. Um, kind of put simply, we build it once in the digital world and then go build it in the real world. Um, and me and my team kind of help the, help the project team to think differently about the, the way they produce information and then what we might be able to do with it. Um, so some of our time might be spent just helping, helping people manage that information, bring all the different models and designs into one space so everybody's looking at the same thing. Um, Another thing we do as well is thinking about taking that information out into the real world and um, thinking up novel uses for it. So Danny mentioned the site vision, which is the image in the bottom left corner there, um, and our digital shields initiative as well, which we deployed in, uh, we've deployed in a couple of sites in Wellington now and we're spreading out nationally. So that's 3D models loaded into excavators that know where they are um, to stop the machines from getting too close to things like the overhead wire or the, the operational railway. Um, and something we've started to move into, uh, which is in the top left corner there now, is around gamification. So taking gaming engines and using those to simulate construction works and uh, maintenance activities to get a really good sense of whether a design is right for the business and whether it's going to work. And it can be hard to, to be thrown a whole stack of technical drawings and manuals and expect everybody around the table to really understand what it is you're trying to communicate to them. Um, especially if that's not something they normally work with in their day-to-day -day life. So using gaming engines is a kind of nice accessible way for us to put information in people's hands. Um, we can simulate maybe some of the tasks they would do and, and tease out any problems that can, can be seen by those, by those teams to feed that back into the design earlier on. So when we, when we do go out and build something, you know, we know we've got a safe and, and easily maintainable asset for the future. Um, so, yeah, thanks very much. Thanks for your time. I'll, I'll pass across to Barbara. Thank you, Andy. Hi, everyone. So I am Barbara Ipolito, asset engineer for Upper South Island here in QRail. So 10 years ago, I have graduated in civil engineer. And on that time, the graduate programs was already quite popular. Uh, most of the engineers would like to be part of those programs. And I thought that for me would be very good also. So I have applied for a few. And after a few feedbacks, I have chosen a railway company. I was very excited because I never imagined that I, that I would be working with railway. All my practical experience during university was on big constructions, buildings and malls. So I was quite excited to understand what a railway engineer does. The program took one year. So it was one year with a deep study in railway. We study not only track, but also rolling stock and operations. And after that, each area would be chosen a uh, graduate uh, engineer. And I was chosen by the engineer area. So the, during the five years I work at, uh, in the railway in Brazil, those are the activities that I used to perform, field investigations to understand um, failure of, of assets like a broken rail, buckle, um, or any other issues, 
Uh, I used to do some track support study once we knew that we would be renewing a piece, a piece of track. So what kind of materials we would be using? What is the size of the rail? What the type of the sleepers, the formation? Um, in, in the railway that I used to work was 9,000 kilometers of track and each line, there was different uh, characteristics for rolling stock like Exo per ton, um, the operations, how many tons per year uh, it would circulate on that piece of the track. So there was quite um, strategy decisions around which materials to use in each of those lines. So I used to do those type of studies. Also some studies to increase line speed um, to, to gain on time performance for our um, trains. Um, I was also involved in studies to increase grain productivity and to improve track stability analysis. This one was a quite interesting one. Here you can see some equipment on the track. This is what we call STPT, single tie push test. We developed that to understand the stability, the lateral resistance of the track. So if you see this graph here, if you have a consolidated track, you will see that you have a high, uh, you have a, a high lateral effort. So if the track wants to buckle during the summer when the, ter the temperature is warmer, you will have some constraints and then the rail will be on the same place. You will not have any track geometry issues, but if you do have some disturbance on track and maintenance, it, it causes disturbance. And for example, if you have a tamping coming through, you will see that the lateral, of the, the lateral resistance of the track will reduce a lot. And that's why we have TSRs in place every time we have some some kind of maintenance on track. And later on, once we have some traffic going through, the, the, the lateral resistance will increase and then we'll be able to uh, increase or remove the TSRs on the track. So here it's after a few trains running the track. So this was a quite interesting project where we could also understand what the type of sleepers would provide a better um, track stability. And I also had a lot of uh, other opportunities. For example, in Brazil, our track, it was on CWR, Continued Weathered Rail. We used to have um, a joint on track every 216 meters, which was bad not only for the asset itself, for their life expectations, but also for, for the dynamic train and, and track. So we had some studies around that. We purchased a flat weld, uh, flat, um, flat but weld truck to do some welds, which are much, much more reliable than the termite welds uh, into the field. So we have done all the implementations of that and doing trainings with the team to understand how we could be managing um, the track during the summer and during the winter. I also had the opportunity to do some benchmark trips for Mexico, United States, to understand what they were doing, to try to implement in Brazil. And all this experience I had uh, with the railway gave me opportunity to come to New Zealand. So I came to join Kiwi Rail team. And if you look at for Kiwi Rail, we have 4,000 kilometers of track, which it is divided between Auckland Metro, Hamilton, um, Palmerston North, Wellington Metro, and here in South Island, Upper South Island and Lower South Island. So I am the asset engineer for the Upper South, which it is pretty much everything from Ashburton up. And each of those regions has this infrastructure area with a regional infrastructure manager, an asset engineer, production manager, structure manager, ST manager, which it is a center for signals, um, track and electric manager and a planner. So in my team, I have a team of field asset engineers, track inspectors and instructors inspectors. And the tasks that my team, the field asset engineer, asset engineer does, it is track inspections and field investigations, root cause of failure and track stability analysis. So if we do have a defect, we want to, to do a root cause to understand what caused that failure 
to not only correct that defect, but also avoid future occurrence. We do investigations to understand what are the works required to be engaged. For example, if we have every flooding, we have um, every rain, we have flooding. So what are the type of works we need to be engaged to improve drainage? Um, this is an example of a root cause to understand why we, we had a buckle and a rail, uh, a broken rail. So sometimes you can have a, a new rail already suffering with broken rail. So we do an investigation to understand. So how it is the formations of their area, there is any other thing that we need to engage on um, apart from just do the, the rail itself. Uh, we do, so with all those inspections, there is a huge work bank generated. So we need to ensure we are prioritizing those works. So we are also responsible to ensure we have a deliver, deliverable work bank in place. And we use a lot of data to make decisions. Uh, and we have the EM80 car, which measure the track geometry of the track. And once we, we have this deliverable work bank in place, we are also responsible to scope the jobs, scoping a level crossing upgrade, a rail site, a face through sleeper. And the railway is not like the road. When you want to engage some work in the road, you can close the road and divert the traffic. But the railway, there is no other way. So, we usually plan in some big block of lines to engage as much as we can. So for example, this last block of line that we had at Main South Line in a Christchurch area, we it was three days of block of line. We have realigned a curve. We have done a formations in a very poor locations with poor ballast. We engaged a level crossing upgrade for a concrete slab. We have also done a drainage. We have upgraded 600 meters of inside the Littleton tunnel. So we try to optimize and do as much as we can with the time of the block of line. And with the asset team, we also have several weather events. So the last three years that I'm here in Christchurch, I think I already had three or four several weather. And this is quite challenging because we, we want to ensure the trains can keep running safely on track. But here in New Zealand, especially here in the South Island, though, though those rents can be quite severe. So there is a lot of actions that we need to put in place. We need to, first of all, ensure that the team are safe, that they are not out there exposed to any risk, a risk to have a slip on their head or trees falling down. So if we are too concerned with the amount of rain that, that is coming or that has, has happened, we also engage sometimes some helicopter run to ensure that the team will be safe to be going out there and starting the inspections. For example, this one here, I'm not sure if you guys will, will notice, but it was a slip and above here we have some cracks. So we were able to see that from the helicopter. So while the team were in the floor, thinking that was all good to clear up that area. We could see that there was risks. So we had a geotechnical engineer on that location during the whole time when the team were working to ensure that they wouldn't have any movements so they could perform their, their work safely. And so the first thing for us when we have a severe weather event, it is ensure everyone is safe, then open the track for trains and then trying to work around the level of service. So this, those are just a few things that we perform, but everything we do, it is to ensure we have a safe, reliable and efficient rail network. And the good part of it, as you could see, there is a lot of tasks performed, a lot of work, but work with Kiri Rail, it's really good because we do have the work balance. So while we are all busy doing everything and ensuring the rail network it is safe, we also have the time for our personal life. As you can see, I have two kids, my husband, and so far has been awesome to be part of Kiri Rail team. Um, I started as a field asset engineer in Palmerston North, and then in 2018, I moved as a field asset engineer here in Christchurch and in 2021 I become the asset engineer for Upper South Island and it's been a great challenge uh, it's very excited 
And if you if you if you are a young engineer and it's just thinking about what are the opportunities you would have, those are a few of them. Uh, we have a lot. And if you do have any interest, you can access the careers in Kiwirail. And I am sure you will find something that, that you will be keen. So that's all for me. Thank you. Awesome. Um, th thank you, everyone, for, for all those presentations. There's some, some great stuff in there. Um, I can see we've got a, a few questions, so I'll jump to those in a second. I think Barbara's last slide of just all of the different types of engineering that is, is available for careers in rail engineering. Um, it has not just been a, a bridge engineer or a rail engineer, it's been a electrical, mechanical, telecommunications, environmental, geotechnical, hydraulic, civil, um, yeah, all, all, all sorts, and I've probably missed quite a few there. No, yeah, so, this is just into the network service, like for, oh, yeah, 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 sorry guys, I forgot to mention, just in like in my world, you know, there's yeah. plenty more in Kiwi Rail. Definitely, um, and it's, it's as, as I think you'll have heard from where people are, are from, it's a very international career. Um, so I've had the chance to work overseas myself, and, and so have, have um, some of who you've heard from, um, yeah. And it is growing in New Zealand. Uh, the RTSA now has has a bit over two hundred members, um, but we, we we certainly get a lot of interest on in the increased amount of work that's happening in rail in New Zealand. Um, and while I've been talking, I've seen another questions being added, so that's cool. I'll, I'll jump to the questions now. Uh, a couple of these were specific. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to because two of them are around rolling stock. So I'll, I'll give one to Jared to start with. Um, are shunt locomotives only used to assemble the wagons together in small works? Or can they be, be also used to, to take big loads uh, or passengers to different stations? Yep, no, that's a good question. So the main difference between a shunt locomotive and a mainline locomotive is the uh, horsepower capacity of the engine and the driving system. So generally shunt locomotives are limited to around about 1000 to 1500 horsepowers, whereas a mainline locomotive um, would be somewhere around the two and a half to 4000 horsepowers. So in terms of undertaking their heavy loads, um, shunt locomotives can still be used generally um, within main lines, they do have running capacities generally, um, and they can be fitted out to. Um, but because of their towing capacity, they are not primarily used for that type of work. It's not their core duty. Um, so they're really designed for low speed um, movements as opposed to mainline locos that are operating up around the 80 to 100, 100 kilometers an hour, sorry, um, with that towing capacity behind them of pulling things with 4,000 horsepower or, or above. Cool, nice one. You've got another question coming up, but I'm gonna just throw one open. Uh, and this, this will be who, who wants to react to it. And I know, I know I said I wasn't gonna do this before, but um, what are, are new sustainable developments that are coming up within the rail industry? And I'll just give a fun fact before before I see if anyone wants to put their hand up for answering um, and their, their particular bit of work. But um, any, any freight, um, or, or movement that's on railway lines. It's they rail has seventy percent less carbon emissions um, per ton carried um, versus road transport. So one of the sustainable developments of rail is moving more stuff on rail. So any we, any time that we're creating more rail capacity, we are creating new sustainable um, outcomes for transport. But I'm just going to see is anyone. Uh, Got, got a volunteer for, for a sustainable development that they I'll might be on. doing? I'll, Andy, I'll nice one. Um, there's a couple of other pieces, so um, as well as uh, things that are moving on rails. Um, we've got two new ferries coming 2025, and there's a significant focus on, on the, um, just the environmental performance of those, those ships. They're also fitted out um, to allow us to change them out during the course of their life and improve, I guess, uh, the battery power. Or, um, that they would operate under as well. Um, one of the other initiatives we've got that we're working on at the moment is around um, calculating embodied carbon. So we've got a number of 
big infrastructure projects happening. Um, and off the back of those projects, we're developing some tools to look at things like the design models and drawings and extract from that volumes and material types to be able to quantify the embodied carbon. So um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's necessarily going to reduce our uh, situation instantly, but it's going to give us the ability to at least measure it and then we can start to make improvements from there. So that's, that's another piece that we're working on at the moment. Cool. I was thinking um, someone that's involved in the electrification type field might might have a comment about sustainability and, and that side, Danny or, or Rhea? Yeah, okay. I mean, I can I can talk from a design and engineering management perspective on our projects. We we are heavily involved on where to key park in particular in measuring embodied carbon in all our materials and, and tracking uh, as part of optioneering for sort of value engineering processes and stuff that, that we're, we're, we're taking cognizance of of, of, of of all the carbon elements. So um, CRL, City Rail Link, I think just, just won an award recently uh, from ISCAR, ISCAR rating that was quite high as well, and some of the stuff they were doing. So yeah, it is, it is actively um, underway on quite a lot of projects. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else have a, have a comment on sustainability before I... I think it is important to remind her that as much as we start carrying on more things into railway, we are also reducing the number of trucks on road. This is not only helping to reduce the maintenance of the road, but also reducing accidents. Um, so this is, I think this is a win-win, not just only with sustainability, but also with health and safety. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and and I'll, I'll finish up with um, another plug for rail in general, that we were electrifying uh, the railway tracks, then your your carbon emissions uh, are down massively. Um, and particularly in New Zealand, where, where our source of electricity is, is generally renewable um, from um, hydropower, uh, or we're obviously adding a lot of wind power um, to, to the national grid. And so that is, is what's carrying those thousands of tonnes on a train powered by um, the water from the South Island and new locomotives that QL is getting are, are going to be far more um, emission friendly. Uh, next question, um, and this, this is another specific one for possibly for Jared, I think. Uh, do the electric locomotives require less maintenance than the diesels? Unless someone else wants to get that other than Jared. Uh, so yes, in general, they do. Um, but the maintenance is obviously very different. So while a diesel locomotive would operate with maintenance that's quite similar to your car, you've got a rotating motor, which has obviously pistons, cylinders, uh, uses oils, fuels, uh, has fuel tanks, um, uses fuel filters, oil filters, all of that sort of um, equipment. Uh, and that, is quite hands involving and obviously can, depending on oil degradation of fuel consumption can be things that you'd need to look at semi-frequently. Uh, an electric locomotive still has wearable components. So they still have, they use um, carbon brushes on the top of a pantograph, which connects it to the overhead wire. So they wear quite regularly. They've still got, um, use a transformer, which operates with oils and waters to cool the electrics um, as well as the cooling system to cool the electrics down. So there is a different style of maintenance, um, but in general, to answer the question, yes, uh, an electric locomotive is generally less uh, frequent maintenance and less involving maintenance than um, a diesel locomotive, at least up until the point when you need to be servicing the transformer, um, which is generally quite a long period between um, services. Nice one. Um, just as a warning, I'm going to ask this next one as a, as a two-part question to cover both. Um, so it's it's uh, what project are you most proud of, and um, also um, so stuff that you like in your job, and um, part of your job that you, you don't like so much. Um, and I thought I might just go around everyone uh, for that because that probably closes our questions out, um, unless anyone's going to type another one in. But Ria, would would you be all right to? To answer that as a as a starting point, um, as to projects you you're most proud of, or piece you're most proud of, of of your work, and any any part of your job you, you haven't particularly enjoyed. Um, I guess 
uh, there's a project that I'm currently involved with um, and it's it's been a big learning curve for me. So it's the upgrade of um, four traction substations on the NIMT, um, North Island main trunk, which is the electrified portion from Hamilton to Palmerston North. Um, so it's upgrading four substations. Um, it's upgrade of a few components that are sort of nearing end of life or um, yeah, it's just sort of there at its end. Um, but it's been a big learning curve for me. It's just understanding the different design um, components involved. It's not just here, all these, um, a lot of consultants as well. Um, yeah, and then going to, I got to go to site quite a few times, um, just understanding how it, it contributed to a lot of my learning over this last year. Um, and just also understanding how COVID's impacted it. Um, equipment not, you know, getting into the country because of COVID delays. Um, but no, it's been a good one. Um, just sort of, you know, seeing at the beginning, not being able to contribute much, just sort of sitting in and trying to understand and learn. And then as time progressed, being able to um, give more input um, and also tying in with what I don't like. Um, a lot of, um, especially in, in certain areas, we don't have like up-to-date, um, documentation or drawings, so especially things like this in IMT project, um, we've got drawings from back in the 80s and, you know, it's it's all like scanned paper copies and then, you know, you've got to go through the process of getting it catted up. Um, it's a bit of a mission um, and, you know, you don't find things always when you want it. Um, I think that's that's a big challenge that you would find, um, not just possibly in traction electrical, but in several areas. Um, it's just a historic issue thing. Thanks. No, no, nice one. Um... Danny, um, project that you're you're proud of and, and part of your, your your work you haven't enjoyed as much? Yeah, so I, I can probably say that Wirtiki Key Park's been been the biggest achievement in New Zealand uh, with regards to rail for me and probably for Downer. Um, just being part of the bid team and, and winning the tender and seeing seeing how that's progressed and the relationship flourishing with Kiwi Rail uh, and where that's going is is pretty pretty good. Um, I'm going to speak for one of the one of the jobs in the UK that, that we did that stands out in my mind and it was I actually used it in my charter ship review when I was back in the day but uh, we, we demolished a mid, a mid the mid span of a 16 span arch bridge in a, in a 15 not 15 54 hour block uh, possession block of line and rebuilt it uh, back back to services within 54 hours it was quite an achievement so it stands out in my mind um, what do I enjoy uh, sort of like I, like I spoke in the presentation I enjoy um, working through the nitty gritty sort of issues in design and engineering and the system elements and, and then sort of seeing the fruits bearing on site that once you've actually got over the line, you've handed over to the construction team and the, the whole assurance about getting it signed back in, back into service and built. Um, uh, what, what don't I like about my job? I'll have to be careful with what I say, but um, I mean, some, <laughs> some some designers sort of not, not, not doing the job um, as they should and having to get a big stick out and sort of poking with it at times, but uh, more often than not, we get there, so it's all good. Cool, I'll flip to a designer, um, Andy. Uh, <laughs> on on um, stuff that you, projects you, you're proud of, um, and um, yep. things, things you didn't enjoy so much. Cool, um, I'd say probably projects most proud of would be the Trent and Upper House project. So that was Kirill's first kind of the, the digital project. Um, which uh, we sort of just wrapped up recently. We won a, I guess we won a good number of awards, and it got um, selected as a beacon project by the construction sector accord. So it was kind of a um, affirmation that we're heading in the right direction. So that was that was really rewarding. And um, the the bit I don't enjoy, I guess it's um, it's probably the, the sweet end desire of any job. It doesn't really matter. It's the thing that can make a project or a job great, and it can make it bane of your existence but um probably about the people you know there are things um there are days when it can be frustrating and especially in the digital engineering space we're kind of challenging the status quo and trying to do things differently so that um change is hard and if you're the person that's coming kind of coming in with that message of change you're not always well received um but uh you know i think it, conversely that can be the the best part about it as well as is, is the people and you know when we do um offer up something smart and think inside the box and solve some problems for people 
and make their life a little bit easier and a little bit, you know, things a little bit quicker for them, then it's it's, it's usually rewarding. So, um, yeah, that's that's probably the you know, two sides of the same coin. That one. Cool. Um, I'll go go to Barbara next. Those those same two questions. You're up to. Yeah. So I don't really have a particular job like project and um, I think everything we do it's quite challenge and it's really good to see the results the outcome of it reductions of TSRs which are the speed restrictions H40s having an assertive work bank but what most frustrates me in my current position it is my core work here as an asset team it is asset data and quality data um, and for the regions there is still a lot for us to improve into the technology part of it we still do a lot of manual inspections so the engineering inspections it is the most part of the most important part of my team and they collect all those informations is still manually in a paperwork so hopefully and the lion will be who knows keen to help the region here come on we also need some help into this this technology part of it you know yeah so i think this is what really what i don't really like it because i know that is annoying for for the team to work with the paperwork but i know that kiwi rail has a lot of project on that and i see some future in the end of the tunnel you know which it is good um, there's been a couple more questions come through, but we might not get time for them. But I do want to give Jared those same couple of questions. Um, uh, yeah, just before we wrap up, because we, we might be getting tight on time. So, Jared, those those same two things. Yep. All right. So, um, I'll just go quick. So, uh, project or part of the role that I like most um, is that uh, in my role as being in the rolling stock maintenance part, you're working heavily towards providing. Um, a reliable and service of reliable service offering to our customers. So we're really forefront in making sure that the trains actually get on time. They do the job that they're intended, whether that be taking you to a an event as part of a passenger, or whether making sure that your Christmas um, goods arrive on time um, without having that reliable service. Um, we know that being the customer at the end of the day, um, you're not going to be happy if it's not if it gets delayed or it gets lost in the services. So that's really key um, for me. In the part of the job that I probably don't like is the fact that as a ma in terms of maintenance is it can be a thankless job. Um, often the good aspects of what you're doing, the hard work that you put in is generally unnoticed. Um, the things that you will be noticed on or will be raised to your attention are when things go wrong. So when things do break down, when there is faults, um, those are the things that you're generally called for the general that you're generally discussed about rather than the work that you've all the good work that you have done. So it is, it is, can be tough and a lot of people can struggle with it, but um, it's also can be quite a rewarding thing to know that you've achieved those and, and have fixed those things for the customers to work through those things that have failed or broken down. Cool. Um, we might wrap it up unless we has got a quick comment on traveling as a graduate. I think you could, you got to do a bit by the look of it. Yeah, um, I started off uh, when the grad program started, there was a bit of an induction, six or seven weeks, um, and half of it was just traveling around the business to um, understand how it all sort of ties in together. Um, and then when I was doing the rotations as well, um, did have quite a few away rotations planned, um, but COVID did cut in right in the middle of that. So I only got one ro away rotation in Wellington. Um, I'm based in Auckland, so. Yeah, but otherwise it would have been a part of that. Um, and otherwise it's just um, travel with the projects that I work with um, at the moment. Yeah, being, being a national railway network, um, people I've, I've found do, do tend to travel quite a bit um, around the country, which is great. Hey, um, I think we're, we're at the end there. Um, and um, someone's asked if they can connect on LinkedIn, but I can't tell who, who they are. Um, so possibly if we know who you are. Um, thanks to all the presenters. Thanks to everyone that came and watched. Um, and and um, hopefully you got something out of it. Uh, and thanks to Engineering New Zealand for putting it on. Um, yeah, cheers, cheers everyone. And have a good, good evening. Thank you, everyone. See you later. Thank you. Cheers. Oh, thank you. Bye.